Welcome back students. Hopefully at this point you have a working version of our application on your local host that includes a login and content management system that provides access to our djbasinclient.php web map to anyone who you've given permission to view that map. And it also prevents access from anyone who you haven't explicitly given permission to view that map. And you also have our five database tables or feature classes loaded into PostGIS. And this is the starting point that we need to continue our development which will begin in this lecture. Right now our application is still reading data from GeoJSON files that are stored on the server. And we want to change that so that we're reading data that is stored in a PostGIS database so that other people have access to the same data. And how are we going to do this? Because PostGIS is running on the server and our data is stored in a PostgreSQL database which means that our data is stored in a number of different tables. And each table is composed of rows, which are sometimes called records, or if it's spatial data, a row in the database might be called a feature. And each row is composed of a number of columns, which might also be called fields, or again, especially with spatial data, a column in the database might be called an attribute. And this is a specific piece of information about a specific feature such as its name or its status. So that's our data. We also have a leaflet application that's running on the client. In the case of a web application, the client is the browser. And leaflet can display data that's stored in GeoJSON format. And so leaflet is how we're going to display the data that's stored in this, on the server. And with GeoJSON, we talk about objects. And each object has a number of properties which are specific pieces of information about a specific object. And hopefully if you have your thinking caps on, you're already making the connection that objects are analogous to features, and thus also similar to records or rows in the database. And properties are analogous to attributes, and thus also analogous to fields or columns. So now we have some common ground. For the purpose of this course, rows in the database are the same as objects in JavaScript, and columns in the database are the same as properties in JavaScript. And all that we need to do is convert our PostGIS database tables to GeoJSON format, and then we can display it in Leaflet. And if you've taken the prerequisites, you should have a pretty good understanding of what GeoJSON is. But if for some reason you still aren't clear or you just want to review, I've included a lecture called All About GeoJSON in the bonus lectures. It's a lecture for my Introduction to Web Programming for GIS Applications course. And it will tell you pretty much everything that you need to know about GeoJSON, at least for the purposes of this course. So to help clarify this in our minds, consider that we have a table in PostGIS. This table has three attribute fields named ID, status, and species. And it also has a column named geom that contains the spatial data in a binary format. That isn't going to make sense to us humans. Now what we need to do is somehow get this data from a PostGIS database table into GeoJSON format so Leaflet can understand it and display it properly on our web map. And all GeoJSON objects have a type property so when we read it, we will know exactly what it is and how to interpret it. The main GeoJSON object that we will read into Leaflet has a type property with a value of feature collection. As soon as we see that it has a type property with a value of feature collection, we know that it will also have a features property that contains an array of features. So the feature collection corresponds to an entire table. And each feature in the feature array is a JavaScript object representation of one row in the database. So the first element in the features array is an object that has three properties. The first property is a type property, like all GeoJSON objects. And in this case, it's a type of feature. And as soon as we see that it's a type of feature, we know that it will also have a geometry property and a properties property. And sorry for the tongue twisters. I didn't create these names. 
I just have to deal with it. The geometry property contains the spatial data in GeoJSON format. And this is just a text-based representation of the binary data in the geom column in the database. The geometry object has a type of multipoint and a coordinate property that contains the coordinates for the point. The properties property contains a JavaScript object that contains all the non-spatial attribute data for this feature as a set of key value pairs. The first property has a key of ID that corresponds to the column heading ID and a value of 1 that corresponds to the value of the ID column in the first record. It also has a status property with a value of active nest and a species property with a value of red tail. And these correspond directly to the value of the status column in the first record and the value of the species column in the first record. So this entire GeoJSON feature shown in green is the first element in the features array and it corresponds to the first row in the database. And then we have a second feature in our GeoJSON features array shown here in blue that corresponds to the second row in our database. And I don't have a third object here because I ran out of space, but we could easily have one that would correspond to the third row in the database. And in fact, in theory at least, there's no limit on how many rows we could have in our database table or how many features we could have in our GeoJSON data. So these are really just two different representations of the exact same data. Our only task then is to convert from one to the other. So let's think about how we would do that. Our first step is going to be requesting the data that we need from the database. And we need to do this through SQL or structured query language. SQL is how we interact with the database, and hopefully you know a bit about that. I talk about it, I talk about the basics in my Introduction to Web Programming for GIS Applications course, and I go into a lot more detail in my Introduction to Spatial Databases with PostGIS and QGIS course. But in order to send the SQL request to the database, we need a little bit of PHP, and specifically we need an extension to PHP called PDO for PHP data objects. And PDO will make it very easy and very secure to send SQL queries to the database from PHP. And then after we send our SQL request to the database, we will get a response that will be either the data that we requested with the SQL select statement, or some type of success message if we were using some other type of SQL request that doesn't return data, like an input or an update statement. Or if there's an error in a SQL, we might get an error message. But for right now, we will be requesting data. So we will need to convert that data that's requested to GeoJSON. And we can do this with PHP. And that's very fortunate for us because remember, we also use PHP to send the SQL request to the database. PHP also has tools that will allow us to loop through the data that's returned one record at a time. And each record can be converted to a GeoJSON feature. Now, we could do this directly. We could add all the curly brackets and colons and commas and semicolons and square brackets, etc., manually to create valid GeoJSON. But it turns out that it's a lot easier to use associative arrays as an intermediate step. Associative arrays serve the same purpose in PHP that JavaScript objects do in JavaScript. They contain data in the form of key value pairs. And those PHP associative arrays can be converted directly to valid JSON with a very handy PHP function called JSON encode. You simply pass that function a PHP associative array and it returns that same data in JSON form. Now again, this should be review if you've taken the prereqs for this course, but let's take a look at this in a bit more detail just to make sure we're all on the same page. Let's create a variable called dollar sign data. Remember, all variable names in PHP begin with a dollar sign. And we will assign to that variable an associative array with three elements. The first element, shown here in blue, has a key of ID and a value of 1. The second element, shown in green, has a key of status and a value of active nest. And the third element, shown in red, has a key of species and a value of red tail hawk. 
So again, we have this concept of key value pairs, just like JavaScript objects. And in fact, this associative array that we just created is just a different representation of this JSON object. Here we also have a property named ID for the value of 1 in blue again, a property of status with a value of active nest in green again, and a property of species with a value of red tail hawk shown in red. It's the same data whether it's represented in PHP as an associative array or in JavaScript as an object. In fact, you could convert a PHP associative array directly to a JSON string using the very handy JSON encode function. Well, you could convert a JSON string to a PHP associative array using the also likewise very handy JSON decode function. So really, this is just two different programming languages with slightly different vocabulary, using slightly different syntax for doing the exact same thing. And fortunately, it's very easy to move from one form to the other. Now let's go to the editor to prove that this works. I'm going to create a new file in my content directory, and I'm just going to call testArray.php. And as always, I'll start with opening and closing PHP tags. And then I'll create this associative array, just like I did in the PowerPoint. I do that using square brackets to delimit the array, and then each element in the array has a key that's enclosed in parentheses. And then this equal sign greater than symbol, which seems a little strange if you're coming from other programming language, but it's the way PHP does it. And a value. So that's one element. And then to separate the elements in the array, we use a comma, and we can start a second element. And that's going to be status, again, equal sign greater than symbol. And this one will get a value of active nest. And then another comma to start a third element. And that's going to have a key of species and a value of red tail hawk. So that's an associative array. If I want to echo that out as GeoJSON, I will just use the JSON encode function and pass it the name of the variable that's pointing to that associative array. And I'll save this. And then I'll go to my browser and type localhost webmap 302 content and test array.php. And I'll run that. And you see what we get out is the same data that we created in our data associative array, but in JSON format. Now it can get a little bit more complex because we can also nest associative arrays. Let's create a PHP variable called feature and it will be an associative array with two elements. The first element will have a key of type and a value of nest. That's shown in blue. There's nothing unusual there. But the second element will have a key of data. Also not unusual. But its value will not be a string, but another associative array. In this case, the one that we created above and assigned to the dollar sign data variable. So the associative array referenced as dollar sign data is nested as the value of an element in another PHP associative array. Fortunately, this doesn't create any problems for us because JSON can also nest objects, like we see here where the value of the data property in this JavaScript object is another object, just like the value of the element in the associative array was another associative array. And again, fortunately, this presents no problem because the JSON encode and JSON decode functions have no problems with nested arrays or nested objects. So let's go back to the editor. And I'll add that line right in there. And then I'll change the variable that we're encoding from data to feature. And we'll go back to Chrome and reload this page and see what happens. Ooh, unexpected equal. 
on line three. So what did we do? Ah, uh, don't have this greater than symbol. So let's try that again. Right, so now we've had that nested associative array and when we encode it to JSON, we have a nested JavaScript object where the value of this data property is another object. But we can get even more complicated because an element in a PHP associative array can also contain a normal PHP array. These are similar to arrays in JavaScript because they're indexed by a number rather than a key. So to help illustrate this concept, let's create a PHP variable called $data2 and assign it an associative array. And then we will create another variable called $feature2 and assign it an associative array, just like we did up here, but with different data. Then we'll create yet another variable called $features and assign it an associative array. The first element of that associative array will have a key of type and a value of feature collection. The second element will have a key of features, but its value will be a normal PHP array with two elements. The first element is the associative array referenced by the dollar sign feature variable. And the second element will be the associative array referenced by the variable dollar sign feature two. So we have an associative array as an element with a value that's a normal array composed of other associative arrays that themselves contain associative arrays. And this is one reason why I recommend using PHP associative arrays as an intermediate step. It would be possible to build a JSON string with these nested objects yourself, but it would quickly get confusing. And trust me, they can be very difficult to debug. When you have all these nested arrays and you're trying to make nested objects, you end up having to write recursive code. And while that's a valuable skill to know, it's also something that I recommend avoiding if possible. So luckily we have this JSON encode function and it has no problem at all because JSON objects can also have JavaScript arrays as a value of their properties. So it will have no problem at all converting this complex associative array into valid JSON. And hopefully now you're looking at this JSON object and thinking that looks like GeoJSON. And it does look a lot like GeoJSON. It's not actually valid GeoJSON, but it's close. And you now have everything you need to write a PHP script that would create valid GeoJSON from the results of a SQL query to the database. And that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. And we'll see you then.